And up next, we have Tarjim Lee, which is a team from MIT. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Atif. I'm the co-founder of Tarjim Lee. We're a translation service for refugees and NGOs. So what most people don't know is that refugees are actually struggling with language barriers every single day. And it makes their lives exponentially harder. Imagine talking to like a doctor or a lawyer that you can't even speak to. So in our research of the refugee crisis, sorry. in our research of the refugee crisis, we discovered two very unique things. The first is that the vast majority of refugees are actually in need of translations or interpreters regularly. And this generation of refugees, internet access and smartphone access, is an unprecedented opportunity to help them. The second is that there are way more translators than you think. In fact, any bilingual could easily volunteer as a translator for a refugee in real time from anywhere. Tarjimli, which means translate for me, allows them to volunteer as a translator in an app that they're already using, like Facebook Messenger. So when we were in Greece, there's actually an interesting story I'll tell you guys about. When we were in Greece, we were uh, showing Tarjimli to a couple of refugees, and another refugee comes up behind us and actually says to us, uh, you know, he, th he thought that we were refugees as well. He said, don't waste your data on these translation apps. They're all bullshit. And we said to him, okay, we'll play along. What, he said, we said what, what apps are you using today? And then he pulled out his phone, and he showed us five different translation apps that he was using. He said, all these computer translations, they're always wrong. And we said, okay. Well, Tarjim Lee actually gives you a real human translator. And he said, you get a real human to do the translation for you? That's game changing. How do I get Tarjim Lee? So we showed him. The first thing he does is go to Facebook Messenger. And it's a very simple process. He picks the language that he speaks. So any refugee picks the language that they speak and the entire application is in that language. Second, they pick their role. So a refugee, an aid worker, or a translator. In this case, he'll pick a refugee. Next, he picks the language that he needs a translator for. So we have 16 languages available today, and our translator speaks 63 languages. When he picks that language, our passive pool of translators are pinged, and we figure out the best translator to ping that time using our machine learning, learning algorithm and get them in a conversation where they can chat. They can even call the translator. They can get on a local phone call with them using Twilio, Twilio numbers that we operate. They can send voice notes, they can send text, they can send pictures, they can send documents, they can send everything that they want in a regular chat session. And then when they're done with the conversation, they can rate that session and get a, and that basically tells us which translators are, are the best and bring them to the top of the funnel for the next translation sessions. So that's how Tarjim Lee works. In the last six months, we've recruited 3,000 volunteer translators who are now doing 2,000 translations per week, which is 20 times what we were doing just three months ago. The crazy part about these translators, though, is that 61% of them accept translation requests every single week. And we've had zero quality complaints so far, which, just stop for a second and think. Intuitively, that shouldn't work. These are volunteers, right? But it does, and it's partly due to our matching and scoring algorithm that's a machine learning model built around the feedback from sessions. But it's also because primarily these people can finally have a direct impact on a real human in need. And I think that's what really driving a lot of the people back to our product constantly is that it's kind of this micro-volunteerism at macro scale. It's this idea that I can actually talk to a refugee today and be with them and learn about their problems and help them right from my phone, anywhere in the world. So there was two options before. You could fly to Greece and volunteer for two weeks, or you can donate money to Greece. Now with Terjimli, there's a third option. You can literally volunteer for a refugee at home from, from your home. The vast majority of sessions that we're doing today are actually sessions with, that are about legal asylum, legal documents, the medics on the ground. And I'll get into this in a second. So the, what, this problem is so big that even the NGOs trust Tarjimli to communicate with refugees. Right? These are the lawyers, the medics, people at, staff at the three biggest NGOs in the refugee space, Doctors Without Borders, UNHCR, and IRC, are using Tarjimli today. 
and they can actually service three times the number of refugees thanks to a, thanks to a real-time, on-demand interpreter platform. Th this is something that we talked with the medics about, especially, and they were like, you know, it takes 40 minutes for us to be able to have a conversation with a refugee if we don't have a translator, or have a crappy translator on, uh, on provided for us. But if we have a good translator, we can do these patient sessions in seven to 10 minutes. So they can literally service three times the number of refugees. <coughs> And they love this platform because Google Translate has failed them so much and paid translators are too expensive and too few. Let me go into that in a bit. So why not existing translation services? We interviewed 350 plus, I can't even keep track of the number of people that we've interviewed at this point, about this problem. And that's kind of the direction that we take with product. We figure out what the user really needs by talking to them again and again and again. The biggest problem is Google Translate. People think, why don't they just throw it into Google Translate? It's not good enough. It's not contextually aware, and it's not trustworthy. If you're doing Spanish translations, yeah, you, you might get decent translations on Google Translate, but if you're doing Arabic, Farsi, Pashto, Kurdish, tr to ask anyone that's used these languages in Google Translate, they'll tell you how bad it is. Right? And more importantly, they're not contextually aware. If I, put tomorrow, if I say the word tomorrow in Urdu, I get the same word as yesterday in Urdu, which is ridiculous on Google Translate. It's not trustworthy because if you're a medic or a lawyer, you need to know that this is the right translation that you're getting. The second is paid translators. So there's two parts here. There's sort of the, the too expensive ecosystem, which is basically the resettlement agencies in the US we talked to. I mean, we talked to maybe like 30 of them or so. And they said they're using these enterprise solutions right now. So they're using language line solution, CTS language link, and they're paying 70 to $80 an hour for a translator on the phone. And they help refugees. Like that's where their money and their budget is going. And so what we, dis we, we decided is saying, okay, that's one part of the problem, refugees downstream. What about refugees upstream? What about the refugees that are in the camps in Greece today? Well, there's too few translators in a refugee camp. In fact, you're lucky if you're a medic and you have an Arabic translator in, in the camp with you, right? And that means you can't even service the Farsi, the Farsi refugees, the Kurdish refugees, the Somali refugees. So there's this whole, this whole like, platform of or sorry, there's this whole gap that basically that these translators are not, are not available for and we're being able to plug with Terjimli. Moreover, they're skill limited. So that means you can't get, for example, an Iraqi speaking Arabic you know, translator. You're only gonna get a guy that has like seven different certifications in eight different languages and basically studied two years of classical Arabic. That's what these paid systems do today. And so what we realized also is that the right strategy here is to go direct to the refugee, direct to the aid worker, the people on the ground who are doing the hard work today and who have this pain point. And what we do from there is actually, we have brought on thousands of people, about 2,000 refugees and aid workers into this ecosystem and into this community. And what we do from there is we build a premium tool for NGOs and governments with the best translators. So the, for example, the Greek government is really excited about this idea. For example, UNHCR is really excited about this idea because they can finally get the, the translators that they've not had today, which is a complete gap for them. So this premium tool is basically, think of it like a mobile app that you download. Right now you saw a messenger bot, right? You have a mobile app that you download that you can have basically a subscription to through your NGO, and then you can get our best translators. You can get the, uh, the ones that can do medical translation, legal translation. One of the pain points that we saw is actually female translators. People couldn't get female translators on the ground, and that was a huge gap because a lot of the female refugees don't feel comfortable going through a male translator on the ground. So this creates that distance and anonymity. I'm so, sorry, one thing I didn't even mention is that the whole system is anonymous. So the refugee doesn't even know the translator, the translator doesn't even know the refugee. All you get is their first name. And then what we're gonna do from there is build out this full new ecosystem of translators. Think about the world of translators today, and we're pulling in a brand new set of people who are bilinguals that never thought they could do this. We're also pulling in another set of people, which are the refugees who actually speak multiple languages. There's a handful of these refugees who are most likely gonna get resettled, and these people can actually get a paid opportunity on our platform to do business translation. Then there's some more interesting things around a service messaging API, where you have WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, SMS, calling, all in a singular platform to get translators, that I can explain later, and the data layer about the, about the corpus of language data that we have on our platform. 
And so, sorry, we will structure our, our, our company as a, currently it's a nonprofit, and we structure it as a nonprofit for profit hybrid. So where we compete today is across all, all features and, and uh, content bases, so language pairs, translator count. We basically try to do everything that people are not doing today. And we're succeeding against the competitors today in both the nonprofit and the for-profit space. The for-profit space, the biggest problem is it's just ridiculously expensive. It's just unreasonably expensive for them. So we're competing across all these categories, including real-time video, phone, and, uh, and calling. So we're a team of engineers previously at MIT, Palantir, and Facebook. I worked in service messaging for about a year at Oracle, so this is kind of my domain. Um, but the group of us basically have been passionate about this for the last year and a half. We've worked on it on the side, and then we were recently uh, um, uh, picked by Y Combinator to be one of two nonprofits in their, in their uh, winter 18 batch. And so we are basically now working on this full time and uh, building out the business and the, and the company. So our plan is basically to extend out from the 16 language that we do today and then move into uh, places in Bangladesh, in Italy, build out our service platform and create contracts with, with governments and NGOs, and by the end of the year, help 30,000 refugees. Thank you very much. You mentioned um, the, the uh, Google Translator being a, a really inefficient and, and poor service right now. I know that from experience, it is horrible. Um, <laughs> Why, though, do you think that they will not be better in five years um, and so much better that you know, maybe the, the need for this goes away? Yeah, so it's actually about the corpus of language data. So the language data that they have is primarily driven from usage on the Internet. So whatever is published on the Internet, they basically scrape pages and figure out what the translation is. We have real human translators that are providing that data with not just text but also audio as well which in terms of a, like a data play is absolutely insane. There's so much training and, 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 uh, and uh, like basically language audio training that you can do with actual translations, which is like a gold mine for people in the space for translation. So I think that is really the key difference where they're not going to be able to, even if you, you know, my argument is also that the real time component there is not fast enough. If I get you a person on the phone, you can go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in less than seconds. Google Translate, you have to type everything out, you have to get your translation, you have to flip it, you have to figure out is this even right, you gotta verify it with people. So there's a lot of, I think even the real time component of it is what's really missing for people. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank Follow you. Follow up on that. Yeah. Um, I saw on your competitor um, matrix, you, you listed umbabble.org. Yeah. I know umbabble.com uh, recently yeah. raised a pretty big Series B, yeah. um, they are AI-powered, human-refined. How do you guys differentiate from them? Yeah, so the way that I think about Unbabble, for example, is it Unbabble or Unbabble? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. You told me. Yeah. <laughs> so the way that I think about them is that, um, in particular, people have this notion that machine translation is going to be like the next big thing, and it's going to work really well. But in part, if you actually understand the problem of language on the ground, think about Iraqi Arabic versus like classical Arabic. Okay, th this, this distinction is so large that people actually miscount, they discount the number of uh, different dialects and languages on the ground. So even if you're doing a machine translation approach first, I would argue that that's fundamentally flawed. My, actually, my full argument here is actually in the, in the market opportunity, which is that the translation services industry, industry has it wrong. People have it wrong with machine translation and they don't realize that because globalization is growing the pie here, because the number of languages are diversifying, there's actually a huge market opportunity just in the business translation space. That's completely discounting refugee and migrant translation and service messaging, which are two other opportunities that we're very excited about getting into. Does that answer your question? Okay. These are things also that Unbabble are not touching, which is why I would make the case for these. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm struggling to understand uh, what role sort of te technological innovation plays in this. Uh, you kind of threw out machine learning a couple times. I was like, should I say it, should I not? Super buzzwordy. <laughs> yeah. um, and, but I'm not seeing the machine learning. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, a peer to peer two sided marketplace where you're connecting yeah. two human beings. And I'm sure obviously technology plays a role and maybe plays a role with, you know, finding the right person to talk to the person that wants to translate. But, you know, wh where is the real sort of innovation here yeah. that builds the moat? So I think uh, partly there's a, there's a benefit there by not having a significant, you know, deep 
uh, level of technology behind the platform, which allows it to stay low cost, stay sticky, stay scalable. But part of it is also that the, um, I'm sorry, the part of it's also that the, uh, the machine learning algorithm that we're using, which I was talking about, is actually a passive pool of translators. So when you're, in, when you're using Uber, that's an active pool of translators. You actually know that there's drivers out there who want to be reached out. Because we're doing passive messaging, because we're figuring out based on your previous sessions, based on how you've interacted with the app before, we're actually doing a whole different set of machine learning models, which is using passive pools of, of, of connection to users. So instead of you know, being an active, tra think about activity as well, right? If you're a user, you're not going to turn on being a translator, right? You, you could translate today. If you knew a refugee and you're in the audience right now, you want to step out and help a refugee for 15 minutes, you can't do that unless you actively become a translator. But when you do it with a passive pool, it's significantly more powerful because then we're figuring out exactly who to ping. In fact, that's how we were able to get it down to 30 seconds, which is the real innovation with only 3,000 translators. Imagine if we have 10,000 translators like the next person, how quickly we can get it because we know who is the person that will be available based on their, their patterns of using the application, which is really cool. Can we spend some time talking about the business model, um, especially with the premium product? How do you price it? Yeah. Um, and do you think it will have any impact to your users, the 3,000 who, who right now are using it as a volunteer or micro right. volunteer versus you're getting paid and, and they're not? Yeah. To be honest with you, I'm, I, I, I very much want to like get more insight on this and understand how a good nonprofit business model can expand into a for-profit business. It's something that we're new to. I'm just being completely honest there. But what I think is basically the nonprofit side of this equation is what is actually going to drive the for-profit. You build this base of translators that have already told us, yeah, I would translate for some money. Why not? Right? That's awesome. But if they're being ch if charged to the NGOs, if they're being charged to the governments, they're fine with that. Nobody wants to make money off of refugees. That's where this becomes a little bit complicated and difficult, right? But I think if all, you're also building this idea that, look, I can be a bilingual translator and make money right now. The same way that nobody realized they could be an Uber driver until they actually got on Uber and were like, oh, I have a car, I can do this, I can make money, right? It's the same concept here. And I think what we do is we basically move into this business translation space, give them these opportunities, and, and basically we're undercutting the business translators. Where they pay $70, $80 an hour, we can do it for 40 We take $10 off the top, profit sharing with the translator, and that way we're basically doing, with 3,000 translators, that's like $1.5 million over the year in, in revenue. So just taking a revenue sharing approach, it's a very simple approach, but it's actually, I had an interesting idea around letting people also that are interested in translating for paid opportunities donate their money back to the NGO that they were supporting. So if you do a translation se session for UNHCR and a doctor and you want to do it for pay, we can still be on our paid platform and our premium platform, but you can donate your money back to the UNHCR for that translation session, which would be very interesting, I think. So I don't pretend to know that I know what the business model is. I don't pretend to know exactly what this looks like in like two years and three years. And I'm very much driven by the idea of knowing what a product does today. I go get real users and real data, data to figure out where the product should go from there. That's how I approach it. Tell me about how you're building the marketplace on both sides. Uh, refugees, aid workers, supply side is pretty easy, but how are you finding the translators and getting them to pitch in and say, yes, I'm willing to do this? Yeah, that's and, and keeping them. That's an awesome question. So we actually signed up like 2,000 translators from purely Facebook. Purely Facebook, we were able to get 2,000 translators. From Facebook posts, fa targeted Facebook ads, that was it, 2,000 in, si in six months, basically. Beyond that, I think there's places in language learning centers. I think there's places in even the, uh, what I'm really excited by is actually the refugee camps. So there's like always a handful of refugees that are volunteers in these camps, and they actually get stigmatized because they get all this preferential treatment as volunteer translators to the NGOs. And if those people can, who are most likely going to be resettled because they speak the language, they can actually be paid as refugee translators for this ecosystem. And then it's like building back into its own, its own community, which I think is amazing. So that's one approach that I'm really interested in pushing. It also fits the model of our mission of being a, like a social venture, a nonprofit. But I have, today, we've had absolutely no problem with finding translators, keeping translators, and keeping translators responding to requests. Any other questions? Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll find it. Okay. No, yeah. no, that's okay. Um, 
So how do you ensure privacy? So there's like a two-sided thing here, right? One is the privacy, which means all the data gets wiped out, but then there's also an opportunity on the flip side, which says I have training data sets mm -hmm. for all those dialects. Perfect, yeah, it's a great question. So, so it's, it's always the same questions that I get. So privacy yeah. is a great one. So you, you basically have this barrier between the refugee and, and translator today. That's the barrier that people care the most about. Okay, is that I, I don't want some random person having a previous history of our conversation having these documents. But in fact, the anonymous aggregated data is perfectly fine for these people to, to utilize when you can basically, using OCR, you can cross out basically names. In fact, a lot of the, a lot of the, um, the, the personal identifying information for the documents, people are smart. They, like, cover their, they took a thumb and they cover their name and then there's no PII. And the same thing is holds true for the conversations with names. We can actually figure out what that name is because we know their name. And we can actually pull that out of the conversation and do aggregated, you know, anonymous um, uh, corpus of data for, for translation, which is super cool. Right. But is there an evolution also into using these, these you know, dialect training sets to develop your own counterpart to Google that doesn't have this kind of access? You, you said it, not me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of where the for-profit goes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much.